Hello, good afternoon everyone. So thank you for attending my talk today. So today I'm gonna talking about building a container platform in Ruby ecosystem. So hello again. Uh, I hope the kanji is correct because uh, I, I kind of use Google Translate for this. So, <laughs> so my name is Gio. So I come from Jakarta. So if you don't know, Jakarta is located in Indonesia. A lot of people know Bali more than Jakarta. But actually in Indonesia, the capital city is Jakarta. So yeah, it took about uh, seven hours to go to Tokyo from Jakarta. And then after that, I have to change plan. Uh, so another two hours from Tokyo to Fukuoka. So I enjoy the travel, uh, but most likely uh, to go back to Tokyo, I will take Shinkansen, Shinkansen. I want to try. <laughs> so I work, I work at a company called Gojek. So is there anyone here knows about Gojek? Okay, a few people, sure. So Gojek is actually uh, quite a hot topic in Southeast Asia. What is it exactly? So I try to summarize, uh, but it's very hard because what we provide to the, our customer in Southeast Asia is actually quite a lot. So these are some samples of it. Some people might say that we are the Uber of Southeast Asia, but it's actually quite different because Uber is actually converging to like a ride sharing platform or maybe like a plus the additional of Uber Eats for food, but we actually uh, provide a lot more services. So if you see, we already operate in at least four or five countries, including Thailand, Indonesia, and then Singapore, and then Vietnam. So we provide like uh, num quite a lot of services other than ride sharing. So including some uh, interesting use case like go massage, which basically you can order a massage to your home. Or maybe if you want to buy ticket to be a uh, movie, cinema, you can use our platform also. So we call ourselves a super app. So what is it exactly? We provide like a lot of apps inside one single app. So if you open our application, you will see all these services. And in Gojek, actually we do love Ruby very much. So in Gojek, we use at least five languages. And Ruby is one of five. I mean, we only have five most used language and Ruby is one of them, including others, including uh, Clojure and then Golang and then Java. And yeah, and actually we, we use JRuby, not, not, the, not Ruby, but JRuby, but it's, the syntax is the same, right? Why we use JRuby, it's because we already use uh, other languages in JVM platform, so that's why. We want to make it easy to uh, use interchangeable library. So the other thing that I do in Jakarta is I actu actually organize uh, Ruby meetups. So we help meet up almost every month. Uh, the Ruby community in Jakarta is actually quite old. So if you open our first mailing list, it is dated back to 2001. So almost 20 years, I think. And if I remember correctly, 2001 is the year where we actually have the official uh, document uh, book for Ruby language, translated by, I forget the name, but actually the DHH, uh, meet someone in the conference, and then at that time, the DHH the decided to use Ruby for his Rails uh, framework. So we have uh, several meetups already, and we actually already ha held one conference two, two years ago. Uh, it's on Jakarta, in actually in Gojek office two years ago. We will have one again soon. So if any of you wants to send a CFP, it's already open. It will be held on September, so we still have time. Okay, moving on to my main topic. 
So I'm gonna talk about this, uh, building a container platform in Ruby ecosystem. So what is it exactly? So this is my abstract, but I want to highlight a few sentences. sentences. Uh, the first one is I'm trying to build container platform. Uh, almost everything will be in Ruby or MRuby. And then I will talk about the current situation or whether uh, this ecosystem can support what I'm trying to do. And for some of you who is not familiar yet with the concept of container platform or orchestrator, I will also explain a bit about the generic architecture behind it. So a little background. Uh, so we are doing this because of uh, some kind of situation in my company. So this actually started early last year. Because of our rapid growth, there are a lot of fragmentation in the ground. So every team is moving into different direction. So if you remember previously, we have more than 20 kind of services in the company. And each services has its own people to maintain the service. And be, because we want to uh, achieve rapid growth, we are allowing the teams to do experiments by their own self. So that's why there, there are a lot of fragmentation in terms of platform, in terms of supporting services. So that's why we, are, we decided to converge into a centralized platform. So there are a lot of common tools, a lot of common services. We are trying to converge them all starting uh, last year. There are a couple of principles and considerations that we are thinking will be important uh, for this project. The first one is obviously open source. So we decided to uh, use existing open source project or contribute to open source project. So almost everything that we created for this undertaking is open source. And then we want it to be seamless. We actually already have a lot of services in production. We don't want anything to break during the transition. And because we, at that time, we still mostly use VMs, uh, we are thinking to start exploring containers. We are, st we are still mostly using VM, even until now, because it is very hard to move a significant number of services to containers. We already have like a whole lot of uh, ecosystem on, on VM, so it's not a trivial task. We have more than, I think, maybe several thousands VMs already on production. And then we also have uh, requirements, which is we need to be able to support hybrid infrastructure. So we cannot use cloud for every uh, everything. We are one of our services, which is GoPay. It's a payment platform. Uh, it's one of the most regulated industry because it's payment. And one of the requirements was that we need to have internal, we have to host the services in the country and we need to host it by ourselves so we cannot use cloud platform. So that's why anything that we built for this thing, we, it needs to be support, it needs to support hybrid infrastructure. And then one of projects that I involved was logging. So log, we decided that logging is one common tools or services that everybody needs. Uh, initially we allow every teams to pick whatever tools they want. Some teams use Elasticsearch, some teams use uh, Stackdriver if they are hosted on GCP or AWS. Some teams uh, maybe use another tools. And we decided that we need a single platform to unify them all. So that's why we, the initial version of the, what what called uh, Baritolog. So Baritolog is a, for now, it's a Elasticsearch as a service platform. But we are thinking that by using this platform, you can basically switch any uh, search provider within it. We make it quite modular, so it, it can be interchangeable. For example, we find another interesting project called Loki. It is also a CNCF project, and it's, it is possible that we can replace the full text search with another thing, with Baritol. And then another consideration that we made uh, is that we, are dis we decided to use LXC to host Barito components. Uh, for those that who don't know, uh, so maybe most of you already know Docker. 
uh, LXC is a, actually it's the same. So initially Docker also used LXC as its building block, but it's different now because Docker create another container runtime, but initially Docker used LXC. So it's like a lower level container runtime than Docker. Uh, but the question is why we decided to use LXC? So these are the two main reasons. So it's a, LXC is a drop-in VM replacement. It's very easy to use if you're already accustomed to VM. It's, it, do, it, doesn't, it almost doesn't have any difference in terms of oper operating it, right? And then we also have cookbooks. So we use Chef for almost all of our infrastructure provisioning. So we already use Chef. We already have almost all the cookbooks we need. So we decided to just use the existing cookbook so we can reduce the effort. Right? But one problem with this is that uh, we need a system to manage those LXCs because if we are spawning a lot of containers, if we don't have any kind of system, uh, if, if it's manual, it will be very tedious. So that's why we need a system to manage those LXC. So we, create, we decided to create a platform for that. So it's, it is called the Pathfinder. It is on GitHub right now. So uh, github.com slash pathfinder dash cm or it is actually a abbreviation from container manager. So what is it exactly? It's a container platform and it is written in Ruby and Go, both Ruby and Golang. Uh, maybe some of you does not does not know what is a container platform. So sometimes it is also called the orchestrator or manager. And to explain it very clearly, so I found this uh, neat online um, resource software. So I don't know if any of you have opened this before, but this is quite interesting. So yeah. It has only a single text editor. And then when you open this, you need to explain the hard idea using only the 10 hundred most used words. So they have a dictionary and they, they will basically tokenize your uh, definition and then it will give warnings if you broke this rule. It is quite neat. So I, I use this particular uh, tools whenever I want to explain something to people which is hard to explain. Actually, I, I broke uh, one rule when I used this. So, uh, I don't know why, but software is not included in the most common language, most used words in English. So that's why if you see the red uh, underline, uh, I broke the rule at that, part, at that part. But if I want to define about container platform, it is a software that allows us to manage many computers as if they were a single big computer and assign jobs into it. Right? So we have a lot of servers and developers who want to deploy anything to that to those servers does not have to think and it to, does not have to think about uh, where to put the containers, how the networking. So what it means that we abstract the CPU and RAM. You don't have to really care about the that. Uh, you can put a quota, but you don't really have to care about the total resources available because it will be abstracted away. And then you can also, you must also abstract away the storage. So essentially, if you're using this platform, you will see a single big storage attached into it. And also the network, which is also very important because we somehow need for these uh, containers to be able to communicate with each other, right? Okay, so what is the generic architecture of a container platform? So I tried to make it uh, very simple. So it has at least these four components. Uh, the one that I colored. So the, the left topmost one, uh, the state server, I call it the conscious. So it essentially it stores the state of your containers, of your nodes, of your storage, of everything. And then it needs a scheduler. So what the scheduler does is that it will uh, collect all the information, it will collect all the unscheduled container, and it will give the container a home. So it will 
pinpoint which node or which computer that the particular container will be spawned to. So that's the scheduler, or I call it the brain. Uh, and then the last but also the most important part is the agent. So if you are familiar with this concept called sidecar, the agent will be installed in all the nodes. And then the agent will constantly query the state server to decide whether there are a uh, container that is not spawned yet in its particular node. So the yellow one, the right box, it's the node. And the agent will determine whether it has container that it's not scheduled yet. And if there's any, it will spawn it in the node. So that's why if you see at the, the yellow box, there are container number one, two, and three. And how does the agent spawn the containers? It will communicate to a daemon or the or run, container runtime. So yeah, you can use like a different container runtime. We have LXD, which is the runtime for LXC. We have Docker daemon. We have container daemon, which is the open standard right now, I think, for in CNCF project. And for user to be able to, utili to utilize all of this, uh, they will need to use the CLI. So these are the main components. So to help me remember, I usually uh, make this, um, what, what is it, a mnemonic? So uh, the memory, the conscious, the brain, and the sidecar. To, so these are the basic, the building blocks of a container platform. And right now, uh, in Pathfinder, uh, we use Golang for the CLI and the agent, and we use Ruby for the state server, which is actually in Rails, and the scheduler. And for the runtime itself, right now it only supports LXD, but it's very easy to support another runtime. It, it can be replaced by, if you want to, you can use Docker for it, you can use Containerd. Uh, if I remember correctly, in Ruby we also have Hakoniwa, so Hakoniwa is a, if I remember correctly, it's a, another container runtime and DSL, which we can use to spawn container. Okay, so I will explain about the, how it works. So let's start with the self-registration process. So whenever you want to register a new node, so you want to put a new worker node into the platform, you will need to have the agent installed in the node. And then when you start the agent, it will do self-registration. So it will contact the state server, and then the state server will return a token or any other secrets that you decide to use. You can use token, you can use certificate. So as long as it is secure, right? Because you need a secure channel between the agent and the state server. And then state server will uh, put in database, the agent and the IP information and everything. So if you open the command line interface and then you type this, get notes, it will list down all the notes after the self-registration process is complete. And you can also do something like this if you want to see all the containers that it has. It has. Uh, right now it's empty. We haven't created any container yet. So let's start, let's try create a new container. So if we create one container, we can also specify the image. And then it will be created in the state server. But until this point, no container will be scheduled in any node yet. Because now it's the job of the scheduler. It will constantly pull the information from the state server. If it has an unscheduled container, it will check which worker has the least amount of resources utilized. So it will do that process. And then it will mark it will mark the state server. Sorry, until this point it's not marked yet, but now it will give back the information. And then it will mark it by the name of the node. So for example, it is assi assigned to the node number one and the status is changed from pending to schedule. So what happens after this? Now it's the agent turns 
to do something about it, right? It will also constantly pull the information from the state server. And when it find out that there are one scheduled container, but it is not started yet, the agent will decide to push the information to the runtime. And then after that, the runtime will start creating the container in the worker node. So if you check, if you open the terminal again, you, if you open the CLI again, and you check the containers, you will find out that the containers will be already provisioned, and it will have its own IP. Okay. It also have some other features, like for example, uh, this feature to do a reschedule. So if you have multiple nodes, and somehow your you want to, you decided to destroy the the provision container, and you want to make it run in another node, you can do the reschedule, and then after that it will be deleted in the existing node, and the scheduler will probably put it in another node if it's not if there is another node. So it depends on your infrastructure, right? As long as you have enough node, the scheduler will uh, schedule it properly in node with least amount of resources. So it, this is already live in our internal platform. So we actually currently only manage around 50 plus worker. It's not that much yet, but it will. it, will, it is still ongoing, the rollout process. We're already live for six months, and for now it's only serve our logging infrastructure. But there are a couple of other projects that might use this in our internal tooling platform. And the rollout process itself, it's still ongoing, and we expect at least three or four times the current traffic, at least. I mean, uh, because right now, one of Gojek's focus is to expand to another countries in Southeast Asia, so it is very possible that when every team use our logging platform, the traffic will substantially increase. Okay, next. So uh, let's talk about Pathfinder if we write, write it down entirely in Ruby. So at that time, we decided to use Golang because it already has libraries to handle connection communication with LXD, and it can also be compiled to a single binary, which is quite important. But I'm experimenting, so I'm trying to uh, replace all components with Ruby, uh, particularly MRuby. And MRuby is particularly interesting. Why is that? Uh, there are a couple of other uh, things, but these are the three most interesting things for me, at least. The first one is it's very easy to create executable with it. And two is low footprint. We don't want the agent to hawk all the resources when it runs in the node, right? And the third one is if we decided to replace the uh, our Pathfinder with entirely in Ruby, it will make our uh, project uniform in terms of language, right? So it is interesting. And we also have a lot of Ruby developer in the company. Uh, actually in my team, there are more Ruby developer than Golang developer, so that's why it's interesting. But what is the challenge? Uh, the challenge is most probably the ecosystem, right? Because the, compared to Golang, which is supported by like a lot of company and also baked by Google, they already have like a rich internal library to handle low-level communication or task. But let's see what, what happened if we decided to use MRuby for this. So the first one is obviously we need to write the agent because agent is the most critical part. And it also currently in Golang right now. So what is actually the main use case that the agent does? So the main use case of the agent is to interact with the state server. Right? It needs to do self-registration. It, ne it needs to make queries to the state server. It also have to interact with the local container daemon or runtime. It can make queries also. It can also execute change. For example, if you want to create or del delete an existing container. And also this, 
So it needs to collect and send metrics. But this part is probably can be replaced by another thing, like for example, uh, Prometheus. But right now, uh, for the sake of simplicity, and we right now only utilize like a uh, small number of metrics, so that's why the agent still responsible for doing this. And now let's discuss the need of each use case. So if we are talking about interacting with the state server, which is written in Rails, and it has REST API, uh, what we need is a way to communicate with REST API server via HTTP and HTTPS, right? So to do this, fortunately, I found this uh, client. There are actually a lot of HTTP client in MRuby, uh, and it's it all very different, but like uh, most of them, the documentation is a bit lacking, but it's understandable because MRuby ecosystem itself, it's not uh, very well used, especially in outside Japan right now. So because I cannot speak Japanese, it's a very, Sometimes it's very difficult to find documentation for some MRuby libraries. But this one, uh, the, this one library that I use, it is, it is actually working for our needs. So we use this for doing the query to the state server. And then about the container daemon. This one is a bit different, but it is essentially the same. So if we're talking about LXD and Docker daemon, both of them are actually also using REST API. So as long as you can communicate with REST API using Unix socket, it can work. And also, uh, because each daemon have different specification, we need to create a library that follow that specification, right? So fortunately, this particular library also support Unix socket, so that, that part is sorted. But we don't actually have uh, library to communicate uh, with LXD. So that's why I extracted one library to do that. So this is very simple right now, but we're planning to increase compatibility with the, with the other features that LXD have. And actually, if we decided to use different container runtime, we can write uh, the library for that too. If you want to use Docker, if you want to use um, anything else, Rocket maybe. We can, we can basically uh, create another library for that, as long as we follow the specification. Right? And then for uh, collecting and sending metrics, uh, this basically needs to gather system metrics. In Linux, this is very easy, because there are a lot of uh, tools in Linux, or you can also use the existing uh, tools to gather this information. So right now, this is very simple. Uh, so we decided to only uh, gather the CPU and RAM for now. So we create a small library to handle that. And last part is we need to create a self-contained executable. I found this uh, library, which is very useful for that, uh, to create a single executable. So this is what I really like in Ruby. Uh, there's not a straightforward way to create executable. Basically, to create a self-contained executable that you can just distribute. But in M MRuby, if I open this particular library source code, uh, I now understand that in MRuby, you can create a simple CU wrapper to create executable. So that's why uh, it's very straightforward to do this in MRuby, create an executable. And then now we move to the next component. Uh, we're trying to write the CLI, also in Ruby. So this part. It has uh, similar requir requirements with the agent. It also needs to interact with the APIs of the server. So the requirement is very similar. But we find that there is duplication between the agent and the CLI. Uh, so we also extracted a library to handle communication with the Pathfinder ser server. And because in the past uh, one or two years, I started using Golang, I found that there is a interesting library to, to structure your command line application. It's called Cobra. So I like that how they structure the CLI app. So I created this library 
to it will structure the CLI app similarly with the one in Golang. So that's about the CLI part. And then the two other components, it is actually already in Ruby. So we have the state server. Right now it's in Rails. It's a very, it's quite heavy. Uh, we might decide to rewrite re it later. Uh, but for now it suffi suffices for our requirements because uh, state server is, we need, we need to move this project quickly. So that's why at that time we use Rails. But this one is actually can be rewritten to something else if it's, because right now it's quite heavy. And then also the scheduler is already in Ruby. So now uh, we have uh, all this project already in Ruby. So I, I already test uh, the, it runs fine. I mean, we might decide to incorporate some agent in our production. So maybe we can experiment. We have, uh, or maybe in staging environment, we may replace the staging environment agent in our pro, uh, uh, platform right now. We replace it maybe with the MRuby version. We'll see what happens. But it should not matter much because we already tested it locally and it works fine. So we extracted some library for MRuby, like the for interacting with the LXD daemon. And then the, this is one for internal requirement, the Pathfinder client. We also uh, create the mini framework for structuring the CLI app. Um, this one, uh, these are the two components that we rewrote in MRuby. So previously, both of these components are in Golang. And this one that we just discussed is written in MRuby. Uh, right now we don't touch this, but it will be very interesting to um, improve these two components. For example, if we can somehow uh, make the scheduler uh, clustered using rough algorithm, I do a quick browsing yesterday and I found out that there are a couple of library uh, which is implementing the rough scheduling algorithm in MRuby. So I may do, use that to make the scheduler be able to work in clustered mode. So wrap up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> when I use MRuby, so because uh, I usually use Ruby all the time. And this is one thing that uh, is very different. I mean, we don't have gem file in MRuby. It has built config. And basically, if we want to change the gem, we have to recompile everything, which is nice. Because we will have a single executable, which includes all the library. And then, to my surprise, because I don't use MRuby that much before, uh, it has almost all the libraries that we need to do such projects. So it is actually quite sufficient already. And then I also like the fact that building executable for MRuby application is very straightforward. It is very easy. And this is also to my surprise. So when we compile the MRuby executable, it is smaller than the, the agent in Golang 1. It actually differs quite substantially, but I need to investigate further Maybe I include unnecessary components in the Go agent. Not sure about that yet. And then the, oh, this, this one is a thing that kind of threw me off a bit. Because, I don't know, maybe, maybe there's a mocking library, but I cannot find that yet. But it is hard to create a library for interacting with API server without mocking library. So we create a, a simple mock. Uh, server to handle the test to to avoid this problem, but yeah, I don't think we have mocking library and MRuby yet. Also, uh, when I try to do some concurrency, uh, I cannot find. I think it the thread in MRuby is not available, if I'm not mistaken. So I try to search about it, but the resource is very scarce. But Fiber is there, so maybe I can try using Fiber to achieve 
some concurrency in some part of the application. For example, when the agent wants to send the metrics, it needs to be able to also handle the container creation at the same time. So yeah, maybe I, I will experiment using Fiber to handle that. And also this, so the agent, it, it will be better if we can handle graceful shutdown for the agent. I already handled this in the Golang version, but uh, not sure, I need to explore more about this. So whenever we terminate the MRuby agent, it needs to be, the shutdown needs to be graceful. So. Okay, and then the last one is this. Um, I'm not sure if there's another documentation, but the documentation that I see, especially the English uh, languages, is a bit lacking. I think if we are uh, working on this together, we can improve it. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have time for questions or? Okay, if there's any question or if not, then please. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I, uh, I'd like to know about the uh, background and your motivation more. Uh, I mean, the, there are a lot of uh, container orchestration software yeah. in OSS like yeah. Kubernetes yeah. and uh, Nomad uh, by Hashcorp. Uh, why I, I, what I want to know is just about uh, why you decided to make okay. uh, the software by yourself. Sure, sure. So uh, because this project is actually started last year, uh, we, are, we actually already consider some of the open source projects. Like for example, uh, we do look into Nomad LXE, but at, at that time, when we want to use that, it said in the documentation that it's an experimental feature, which is the, the part that orchestrate LXE is an experimentation. So we are not sure that we can use that for production. And when we try to look into it more, uh, I don't think that the LXE part of Nomad is uh, well meant. I mean, like nobody is working on that yet. So that's why uh, we cannot, we don't have the bravery to use that. Because when, whenever we want to adopt a project, we need to be able to maintain it, right? So that's why we are not confident enough to use Nomad. And then about Kubernetes, uh, at that time it's also does not have support, immediate support for LXE. It has support for the container D, it has support for Docker, but it does not have support for LXE. And I already explained earlier that we want to use LXE because it's a drop-in VM replacement. And so it's a bit different, right? LXE is not a state, uh, what, is, what is called, do when you use Docker, you're expected to destroy uh, destroy the container if you want to update, right? It's an immutable infrastructure thing. But uh, it's different if we want to host stateful application. So we are not that confident yet to use Docker for database for stateful application. So we decided to use LXE, and because Kubernetes and Nomad is not use it, does not support LXE very well yet, we use that. But other motivation is that uh, because in Gojek we uh, face a lot of risk if we decided to one particular platform. So at that time we decided to have several teams uh, working on several initiatives to explore more. So actually what my team is also uh, do more research. Like we are doing LXE, but there are also another team working on Kubernetes. There are also another team working on uh, Nomad, I think. So that's why. I mean, this is basically uh, started as experimentation, but it's working well right now for our logging platform. So we don't have the it does not have to be immediately replaced by something else because it's working well. Yeah. Yep. Have you tried uh, run your software in AWS? How it difficult to run in there and maintain the oh. image? Uh, this software. Okay. Uh, we actually host this in GCP, but. Uh, when we created this, 
it is supposed to be agnostic to the hosting environment so it does not need any uh, cloud platform or so because uh, i already explained about the uh, constraint we need to be able to host this also on data center on our local data center so actually this can run on the local data center so i don't see that the problem if we want to host it in aws maybe so uh most of us AWS have a lot of services, default services, right? Yeah. So, so it, that's mean you we need to only EC2 instances for run your. So we need to manage oh, yeah, yeah. instance by your own side, like yes, like yes, that. yes. So yeah, we we need to use VMs. I um, mean, yeah, but we already have like a automation, like a cookbooks and provisioning things to help with that. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Any other question? Nope. Okay, thank you very much.